hi there. Welcome back to the Non-Servium uh, podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald here in the internet studio. We have Elia Ayub, um, all the way f- from Switzerland, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> which is, uh, that's a new one for ge- geography of guests. Um, <laughs> and here's a little bio for you to get started. Um, Ayub is a writer, researcher, and founder of the Fire These Times podcast, as well as the co-founder of From the Periphery Media Collective. He holds a PhD in cultural analysis from the University of Zurich, is an affiliate fellow of the Post Growth Institute, and is a project manager at Shadow Mag. Uh, he has also written for publications such as 972 Mag, Al Jazeera, Commons Ukraine, Al Jumhuria. Jumhuria, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is Syria. New Lines, Le Orient, Le, Le Jour, Crime Think, I know that one, and Lausanne. Uh, pardon any pronunciation. Uh, he blogs over at iWriteStuff.blog and can sometimes be found on Instagram, Mastodon, and Blue Sky. So, yeah, that's a good proper start, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, we like to start at non-servium besides uh, bios is both what you describe your politics as now and if there was a journey to get to where you are now in terms of self-description of politics. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I would describe myself as an anti-authoritarian person on the left. Um, broadly speaking, I identify with the anarchist current of things. Uh, I, for some time, was using the term solar punk anarchist because it kind of sounds cool. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, <laughs> um, the journey, uh, yeah, I I would say I was always, as far as I can remember, vaguely on the left. But I did, when I was in my teens, I took a detour in many ways and became weirdly conservative when the new atheist thingy was kind of trendy online. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it was at a time when I was I was in my teens. Um, the war in Iraq happened, the invasion when I was twelve, and I grew up in a community in Lebanon that was pretty right wing Christian, um, uh, which is a pretty unique community in terms of the the ethnic makeup of the of the region. And it was pretty easy at the time for me to kind of fall down like and like Islamophobic tropes and 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 shit like that. Uh, because pretty much everyone around me was. Uh, I got over it pretty soon after, thankfully, uh, for all of us, I think. And um, yeah, I would say like there was a bit of a... It was a weird um, time, because I think if you had asked me back then, I would still describe myself as a leftist. But I think I, I didn't know that I was harboring these basically bigoted views about a community that I knew nothing about at the time, because I was in a very isolated, homogeneous, in many ways, um community uh, for lack of a better term so yeah that's kind of the 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 odd detour if you want in my early days but otherwise uh when i got over that uh i've been on that side of the spectrum so to speak and always anti authoritarian as far as i can remember just more and more so i think over the years uh specifically with anarchism mm-hmm. it sounds like you fluctuate with using the term or not um mm-hmm. do you have any memory of discovering anarchism or do you have any changing feelings about it if you're using more anti-authoritarian descriptor? Um, changing feelings, not so much. I, I think sometimes I'm I'm always very wary of what the person thinks I'm saying when they hear a term. And so I'm I'm just the you know, it's it's kind of that 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 kind of what goes through my mind because I don't quite care for the terms th- themselves, as long as they kind of serve the purpose that they're supposed to serve in my head. Um, I do like Graeber's whole, like, anarchism is a verb. So that's something I do like, uh, something to do more than something to be. Um, although there's, like, you know, definitions don't really, I guess at some point it's kind of the same thing. But anyway, um, I, the way I discovered it, I think it was at a time when, like, I probably started reading Noam Chomsky and stuff like that when I was younger. Okay. I I would say I got over him as well, <laughs> but uh, at the time I think it was a pretty um, a healthy dose of skepticism towards 
are the state. That's how I could describe it. Um, again, lots of caveats there with, with, with a lot of the things he has said at the time and since and whatnot. I didn't know as much, but let's say for for the time, for what I was into, it was enough to kind of steer me in a different direction than a lot of my other kind of lefty friends uh, and acquaintances, and some of them kind of like now ex-friends and ex-acquaintances due to these issues, uh, because I I started university in 2011, so the Arab Spring. Um, and I was in Beirut and a lot of the, um, Arab exiles, many of them would go there as well at the time. And there was kind of this, um, ambiance, if you want, of like possibility and really everything is possible. Like quite, like quite literally, we just, you know, the Egyptians were there and, oh, we just literally overthrew the regime and the Tunisians and the, the Syrians were still trying and the Libyans hadn't yet. And, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I didn't know this at the time, but that's also the time when a lot of people, on the left-ish side of the spectrum started developing what I would describe as more authoritarian tendencies. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, I would say like f for whatever it's worth, the um, Chomsky side of things at the time allowed me to have a healthy dose of skepticism towards all of this. And then eventually I kind of outgrew him as well. And it became, you know, I started reading up on other folks and that I find more interesting and kind of expanding my, my worldview, if you want, while, Never not being an anarchist, just not always feeling the need to use that term specifically, if that makes sense. Um, are there, I don't know if I want to ask about those other folks you liked or about the uh, left becoming more, more troublesome. Um, mm. Who else, who else influenced you? If you have any names, um, you can always. At the time, um, I would say pretty early on, Emma Goldman was a big one. Uh, I was just, uh, I think, amazed by just how much she had done, <laughs> just how much she had gotten done in her life, just just like that. Just oh, this was impressive. Um, I was at a time where I was really searching in many ways for role models, I guess you could say, especially in my teens and early twenties. I'm now in my early thirties, um, and Emma Goldman was also like a very healthy, healthy dose of of. Uh, Skepticism, not just towards the state, but more importantly, as someone who's like cis male and whatnot, but towards the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, I I didn't quite, I'm autistic, I should say. So I didn't quite know at the time that this was unusual, um, or at least like uncommon, I suppose, um, that she wouldn't necessarily be like the person people would go to on the left or whatnot. Uh, there would be all of these other names to go through first. Uh, but for me, that was uh, an early uh, influence and... Other folks like Hannah Arendt early on as well. And then James Baldwin came on in my 20s. Mm. Uh, the Fire These Times is named after his book, The Fire Next, uh, the Fire, uh, Next Time. Um, so yeah, a lot, quite, quite a few folks, I would say, uh, from various backgrounds. Um. Oh, there's a Syrian one, Omar Aziz. He's a big one as well. Um, unfortunately killed under in, in Assad's regime uh, yeah. cells uh, some years ago, about a decade ago now or so. But he was an anarchist, so he largely credited with um, helping found the local coordination committees in Syria, which was a big deal in the early days of the revolution. Uh, and for me, that was a huge thing because uh, well, I got to know his daughter as well. But in terms of just like politics, um, the fact that he was killed by a regime that called itself anti-imperialist uh, and that many lefties were sort of, um, you know, swallowing whole the propaganda. For me, that was like a sharp contrast between what he had to go through and what lots of people in my world, let's say, were think, I don't know, were believing, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a good segue into um, the left or the supposed left. Um, mm. I don't know. I could call them tankies. Sometimes we call them tankies. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk more about your experience with, with the people who think they're leftists who are still sort of on the side of authoritarian regimes like... Can yeah, you explain I, that? How does that happen? <laughs> yeah, I, I also, I share your hesitation. I mean, I think if we are to be um, accurate, I do think it's a form of conservative politics, yeah. what we describe as tankism, mm -hmm. that just has like a, a red flair to it, or a red, I don't know. It's like cosplaying in, in some ways, uh, like conservative cosplaying, but instead of this authoritarian on the right, they have one that's supposedly on the left. Um 
the phenomenon is an interesting one in and of itself. I started off kind of being in despair about it, and now I'm more like angry about it than than, than in despair, uh, because I think it's very cowardly and it's a very lazy way of viewing the world, um, and uh, well, authoritarian, obviously, <laughs> way of yeah. view, viewing the world. And what does that even mean? Like, I th- I do think some folks, maybe not like audience of this podcast, but like some folks don't actually know what I mean when I say authoritarian, or when other folks say that. It's not just like oh, a mean mean person. <laughs> It's um, uh, someone who is, if we think about individuals, let alone structures, but an individual like I think of Bashar Assad as a kind of a quintessential example of that, or Putin or, or whatnot, or Trump for that matter, mm-hmm. although they, the scales that they operate in are different in different contexts, but still uh, the tendency is, is there. It's someone who wants to stay in power regardless, and someone who views power not in with a healthy dose of skepticism, which is what how I would, uh, I would try in any case to approach it with but as almost like a divine destiny right this is someone who like is there is in power because uh either god in some cases like in putin's case or whatever his dad in bashar assad's case or whatever uh put him there and he belongs there and it's usually he um and authoritarianism for me is a form of politics which has a tendency of uh becoming a a a center of gravity in the sense that um it everything revolves around it and uh, those of us who are trying to oppose it end up kind of being on the defensive uh, of like saying this is wrong, like, and then spending so much time, uh, even probably within ourselves, like saying, how can they do this? How can they say this? And I, as far as I can tell, they don't seem to have these um, thoughts because they, they're kind of like, they, they don't spend too much time being worrying about the ethical considerations of what they're saying, or what they're doing. Um, anyway, yeah. Some of them seem like, I don't know why I'm, just because I know too many people who have fallen too close to this, but some of them think they are thinking about the ethics. And the nicest possible explanation is that, you know, the CIA exists and America in particular is very nosy. Ergo, you know, sort of everyone in Ukraine, say, is, is a puppet of the United yeah. States and therefore... I don't know. It seems like it should be easy to counter this concept, but you know, I think the the reality mm-hmm. of the intervention is 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 that's reality. But I find myself stymied by this, even though it seems sort of mm-hmm. like the principles are obviously gone awry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I do think there is like I'm here. I'm channeling Baldwin a bit, but there's a bit of a moral cowardice um, in in some positions or in a lot of these positions because. It's it's it starts from the principle of a straw man argument, because mm-hmm. those of us who are anti-authoritarian are not saying, "Hey, America, amazing." Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's not actually that's not an argument being made by the anti-authoritarian left or whatever. Um, the argument is simply that America is not the only one. It's really that simple, and that yeah. means that you already live. We already live in a multipolar world. Um, it's true that America obviously is still the dominant hegemon. But uh, it very much depends where you live in the world and how true that would be respective, you know, with respect to that. If you're in Ukraine or you're in Taiwan or you're a Tibetan or you're Uyghur or whatever, um, your experience of the world is just different or you're Bosnian for that matter. Mm-hmm. Your experience of the world is different. And it should not be that complicated to say that even though you don't like something, like let's say the US, you don't like that they are what they are, that they do what they do. If you're, I don't know, a Kurd in Rojava or anyone who was in Rojava at the time fighting against ISIS, and sort of the only thing that can prevent you from being exterminated is the US being vaguely interested in you uh, yeah. for some time. Um, it's not like you're, you're uh, overwhelmed with options. And the best example I have usually with these situations, and this is where like knowing some history, I do think tankies are bad at this specifically knowing history. Um, but the Spanish Civil War is very, very informative on that. You had a number of folks who were, of course, fighting the fascists, and they themselves were not necessarily all in agreement with one another. You had some anarchists, you had some communists with a kind of a small C, and you have, of course, the Stalinists, and you have the socialists, and a bunch of other, even some social democrats, and so on. Um, and at one point, they were uh, trying to get weapons from a bit everywhere. They were trying to get them from the Brits, from the French. The, I, from what I remember, the French gave them a bit, but not a lot, and the Brits refused or something like that. And at one point, the only ones who were willing to give them are the Soviets. 
mm-hmm. and so Stalin effectively uh, and they accepted it not out of you know uh, gratitude or from the you know happiness but from necessity um, and this is where like knowing a bit of history and then for me this Syrian example especially um, makes it v- made it very kind of concrete if you want it's not abstract to me mm-hmm. that there are situations that you just hate that you have found yourself in and you just need to find a way to make the best of it it doesn't mean you will always make right choices either but it sure it, it certainly does not mean that you're suddenly this stooge of an imperialist power or whatever um i think there's a lot of when i say more cowardice i think there's a lot there's a refusal to engage with the the topic itself with like yeah. Ukrainians, with the Ukrainian cause, with Ukrainian history, with Taiwan, with just other people's lineages and other people's timelines, if we use that internet term, um, is not yours. They just have different ones. Uh, you might have things in common if you dig deep enough because we're all human, but their experience might just be very different in the recent past, especially. And if you don't sort of uh, kind of, I don't know if the term is accommodate, but definitely try and understand it, um, you're sort of just speaking at them rather than speaking to them. And that's what I think tankies are often prone to do. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of them, it's a it's an obsession with only the United States. And without them realizing it, they seem to believe that only the U.S. is acting in the world and everyone else doesn't even exist because they don't have a will enough to have found a cause yeah. or to yeah. have made the compromises you mentioned and things like that. Yeah, it, it. I do think that it's given that often this tendency we see it in the West, although not just to be honest, it is. It's common enough on the African left and Latin American left and the Arab left for that matter. Um, the Asian left, I'm slight Asian is a broad term here, but like I'm slightly less familiar with. Um, but it's a tendency that I think, especially if you're in the West, um, I also think it's a bit convenient. Because it's it's if you're an American, especially who thinks America is the center of the world, well, like you're kind of also the center of the world, and uh, there's a way of like, it's a bit ironic in many ways that this kind of form of so-called anti-imperialism, uh, which you know my friend Leila Shami, who's one of the co-hosts of the Fire These Times, um, calls it the anti-imperialism of fools, going back to the whole anti-Semitism as the socialism of fools of like a century ago. Okay. Um, it's like there's a long history of that. In fact, I, I'm not, for that matter, I'm not actually surprised that you have a comeback of anti Semitism as well in those spaces. Uh, conspiratorial thinking and that sort of thing. It's it's a way of finding uh, quick solutions, easy solutions, and easy, easy answers to complicated questions that are not fit for purpose. And if you already know what the answer is, what, what, if you already know what the answer you want is, let's put it that way you can sort of frame the question in a different way. You can avoid the question that should be asked and kind of ask a different one. I think they do this a lot. I think it's a, it's so much easier. You see these charts all the time, these memes being passed around of like all of the coups of the CIA and all of the interventions of the US. And you you go through that list and some of the peop- some of the countries there aren't quite technically what they think they are, but it's easier to put like, Iraq and Libya are in the same category. And it's easy to put Vietnam and Syria in the same category because then all you need to do is to kind of sit back in many ways and to say what America bad. Mm-hmm. And therefore, everyone else on the other side is obviously good. Uh, and you don't have to deal with Libyans. You don't have to deal with Syrians. You don't have to deal with you know every, anyone, really, uh, because you have found the answer, uh, which is that the country you happen to be in is actually the center of the world and is the bad one. Um, I don't know. For me, I I, can, I went through a lot of different uh, emotions on this, if they <laughs> might come across um, as many obvious, maybe. But um, yeah, it, it is it is a, a uh, it's as I said, I, I'm not like I'm in despair about it, but it's still it angers me and I do still find it um, uh, troublesome. I do as well. I have some people in my life who uh, let's just say should know better, but who fall into these patterns. Um also, you're not American, obviously, and you've traveled more than um, many in America. And, like, I think it's already pretty clear that you are more aware that people in different countries are real and that it's not just <laughs> some battle with America. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. That this is a multipolar world, I believe, which I feel like people 
a lot of people don't think that anymore. Yeah. But... Yeah. I, to be clear, I think terms can be used in different ways. And so this is, you know, go back to that initial conversation of the word anarchism. One of the reasons I hesitate to use any word most of the time is because it can have all of these different definitions, depending on how you're, you're thinking about it. Because there are some folks who might think the word multipolar is good. Because it means, well, at least you have different poles that can challenge the bad ones. Uh, but the way I'm using it specifically is, there's an episode of the Friday Slams called Against Multipolar Imperialism. Okay. And that's how I'm using it. In the sense that you have these multiple forms of imperialisms, often not necessarily even in disagreements with one another. Uh, they disagree on the tactics and the turf that they want to control. And they will have, of course, competing interests. But in terms of the underlying vision of the world, they are more on the same side of things than, than otherwise. And a good example is how the UN veto is used. So you have the US, of course, who uses it all the time to defend Israel. And you have the Russians who, of course, use it all the time to, well, to defend themselves or to uh, defend like Bashar Assad, for example, or to defend Iran. Um, they uh, are effectively doing the same thing. They're just doing it to different people. Uh, in the case of the U.S., the main victims would be the Palestinians. In the case of Russia, the main victims in this case would be the Syrians um, or the Ukrainians, of course. Um, and so multipolar imperialism is is a bit that. And one, so the, the main example I can give you, or I give usually to explain how they learn from one another is the war on terror. The war on terror discourse was obviously, it didn't start with the 9-11, but it kind of went on steroids after that with the Bush administration, of course, and the Blair one in the U.K., um, and in fact, it's that, you know, if you're not with us, you're with the enemy. George W. Bush's uh, infamous quote, I guess. Um, they all have a version of that. The Russians have a version of that. The Chinese have a version of that. Uh, frankly, the Venezuelans at this point have a version of that. It, most of these governments, in, may, in one way or another, if if their main priority is to stay in power, which most of them uh, want to do, then of course your opponent is someone to be demonized. It's not rocket science in many ways. Uh, it just so happens that it 9-11 uh, happened in a specific context where, for example, in Russia, you had already the war in Chechnya. Mm -hmm. In Bosnia, you already had the, the genocide uh, of Bosnian Muslims. And Chechnya are, is a Muslim, uh, mostly Muslim nation. Um, in uh, Xinjiang, so-called Xinjiang, I've, I've since learned that the term is not a good one. It means Western frontier or something in Chinese, in, in Mandarin. Um, in so-called Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, of course, are the convenient scapegoats for the Chinese state because they're mostly Muslims. And so on and so forth. The Rohingya, the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, so these governments, whether it's the Myanmar one, the Chinese, the Russians, the American, in different times, at different, um, sometimes even parallel to one another, like they coexist, as, as is the case in Syria right now. They have in the skies of Syria, you have the Russians and the Americans that coordinate with one another because they don't want to accidentally bomb one another. They don't want to accidentally kill one another because that would be a diplomatic nightmare. Uh, so they coordinate. Um, so for me, that's a good example that they learn from one another. You have the cops from, you know, we know the example of the NYPD and the Israelis learning from one another. We know the example of the, the war on terror, like Henry Kissinger was very close to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and so on and so forth. None of this is rocket science. You know, it's just open. Just people could just Google what I just said. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that none of this really surprises me because for me, I early on I've had this I would say healthy skepticism of power and what power does and having a critique of power. Let's put it that way. That I do think is lacking often in in many of these spaces. Yeah, some people never get that. I don't want to uh, make it all fatalistic, but some people, some people really instinctually get to that uh, skepticism, and some people have real trouble ever getting there. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, I let's see. There's a lot. You have a lot of interesting, um, <laughs> sort of varied topics you've written about, including, you know, like. Um, uh, something about uh, political chants and song, mm. songs for free Syria. We're going yeah. to put some links in. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I do feel like I need to ask you about the um, the war on Palestine, as mm -hmm. um, Al Jazeera ha has, has put it whenever I look at Twitter, which I think is a great 
clear way of putting it. It's not the yeah. war with, it's not the, it's the war on Palestine. Yeah, there's no, there's no Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's a myth. It hasn't, it hasn't <laughs> been a conflict since like, I think the fucking 60s. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's, it's one-sided bombardment. It's really that simple. The other side does not have anything remotely resembling what the Israelis do. It's really that simple. Uh, I, call it, I call it a, either war on Palestine, I call it a genocide. Yeah. Uh, those are the terms I use. I think the word conflict is uh, to still use it now is to be, I think, purposefully obtuse, to be honest. I always figure if, if okay, if you want to get pedantic about genocide, that's mm -hmm. one thing. But anybody who is disputing that it's ethnic cleansing, um, mm. I, I find very, I mean, it's, it, some, some of them are just saying it. They're saying it <laughs> yeah, in every way, much. and then they're doing it. Um, pretty much. More specifically, I guess in this in this most since um, since October, mm -hmm. what do you see is different about this precise? Um, what well, the, the scale, of course, <laughs> the scale is yeah. is something that is uh, unprecedented in um, most histories, to be honest, since the Second World War. In any case, um, doesn't mean no other place has gone through a mass scale violence obviously rwanda sudan right now the drc right now or syria very much so on and off for the past uh, over a decade now mm -hmm. um in and of itself like the fact that horrible things are happening is not um specific to what the israelis are doing i think the the technology is uh what's kind of changing things uh on the one hand you have of course the use of ai uh with some pretty horrific um Consequences, uh, 972 Mag released a report just like about a week ago. People can look it up on the AI uh, program that the Israelis are using. And it's pretty terrifying because I, at some point, this technology, if not already, is going to be like cheap enough to be accessed by other actors, not just uh, what, not just the IDF. Um, and so that's like one thing. The second thing is uh, the fact that it's so documented. There's something very specific about uh, before then, I would argue that the Syrian so-called conflict and so-called civil war, which was overwhelmingly and still is a, a brutal crackdown by the Assad regime. Still, to this day, the overwhelming majority of civilians ma massacred and killed uh, has been at the hands of the regime because it's the state. So I don't know why this would be surprising. Um, um, where I was going with this. Yeah, I mean, it was at the time the most documented conflict in history. Like, uh, And it that that term was used in, in, in that context multiple times. Because of technology, because it was it, it had started in the year of social media, 2011, when social media was already uh, widespread enough and people had enough smartphones and stuff like that. Um, so that's one thing. And so now I would argue that um, the the genocide in Gaza is the most uh, documented genocide in history. It's live streamed, you could basically say, and it is to some extent even true because Al Jazeera has had the live stream on and off for multiple months now. Uh, and of course, all of the various uh, Gazan personalities and people on Instagram and journalists and others also joining in in terms of just filming what's in front of them. The amount of evidence uh, that, uh, let's say, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, if they were to actually go through with what they're supposed to be about, which is, you know, prosecute states for, in this case, the crime of genocide and, and ethnic cleansing, um, would have quite a lot of data to go through uh, to the point that, like, probably going through all of them would take quite literally decades. Um, which is, you know, then brings up other questions of uh, what what does that even mean to seek justice in that context and stuff like that, which, you know. Sure. Um, so that's that's kind of this, the main thing, the scale of things. And the other thing is just how blatantly uh, and patently ridiculous and absurd the response by uh, so-called democracies has been and the complicity uh, especially by the U.S. and to a different extent by like the Germans, uh, the sort of I can only describe it as like a nervous breakdown at the national level in Germany, of like not knowing how to deal with uh, the question of Israel-Palestine, and cracking down on anyone who says anything remotely pro-Palestine, including many Jews, and calling them jihadists and calling them anti-Semitic, like calling Jews anti-Semitic, and stuff like that. Um, there's been there's been it let's let's say that the past six months has kind of opened up a number like a bit of pandora's box opened up a number of um questions in in different contexts it's almost like it's it's almost like this you know 
open wound in many places that it just started rubbing on. Um, and uh, yeah, the scale, I guess the main thing is the scale, really. Uh, there isn't quite anything like it that is that efficient, uh, again, since the Second World War. And the reason for that, um, to kind of paraphrase the UN Special Rapporteur to the Right of Food, Michael Fakhri, who I'm going to interview soon, um, there's a reason why the Israelis were able to say, we're going to cut off all of the food, all of the water, all of the electricity, all of the, all of that. And that's because they controlled all of the entry towards, uh, into Gaza, I mean, uh, before October. And so they quite, almost uh, quite literally had a tap on that they could just turn off. Um, and that level of control over a population um, is unprecedented in many ways uh, because of the, the technology allows it in any case to be like that. Uh, and the, the decades of training, essentially, of them doing just that allows them to be like this. The only other examples is a bit like the CCP in China trying to do that and not quite yeah. succeeding else all the time, but because of there's just a much larger population to control. Um, so yeah, that I think those are the you know the the scale, the technology, the the hypocrisy, the all of that stuff uh, makes it different in that sense. I was not um, very um, familiar with the German response, and it's pretty. It's pretty easy to guess, sort of, a, to pre prescribe a psychological reason for why Germany would be mm. you know, flailing at um, at Israel doing doing the genocide this time. I mean, that's pretty. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. I went I went. So there's a number of I would recommend folks uh, check out like Jewish Currents and they have this amazing podcast called On the Nose, and of course Nine Seven Two Mag that I contribute to as well talks about this a number of times. Um, I used to believe that, you to use a psychological argument, that it's like German guilt over the Holocaust. Yeah. And I'm sure there's an element of this. I'm not I'm not going to say it's not that at all. But I also think there's a very cynical side as well. Uh, right now, and this is from a, a piece from Masha Gessen, uh, Masha Gessen, who's also Jewish, on The New Yorker for, from like a month or two ago, I don't remember, but mentioned like a very interesting statistic, which is right now, if you're a Jew in Germany, you're more likely to be arrested by the German police uh, for the crime of anti-Semitism than if you're a non-Jew in Germany. Like you're disproportionately targeted in that sense because uh, statistically there are more uh, folks who are like Jewish, either German Jews or uh, a lot of them are Israeli Jews who went to Germany because they couldn't handle Israel or for whatever other reason um, that are like center left or on the left or progressives or whatnot and so are not happy with what the Israeli government is doing in their name, quote unquote, as mm -hmm. it claims to do, um, and are being targeted by the German police and by Germany has this thing where every state in Germany, because it's like a federal system, uh, have, I, I don't know the German name, but it's like, you know, someone whose job is to decide what is anti-Semitism and not. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of very ironic is that as far as I know, every single one of those people, or at least most of them are not Jewish. And so they get, to, they give themselves the right. That's how I've been interpreting it. That the German state has once again, despite all of the ironies this comes with, has once again given itself the right to decide who is a Jew. <laughs> and I find that disgusting. Yeah. Um, and I'm not the only one to have reached that. That's why. I, that's why I'm, been rec I'm recommending like a Jewish podcasts and Jewish uh, mm. sites. Uh, they've also reached that same conclusion. Uh, I should say, like, from the periphery, the, the media I co-founded includes a podcast called Hida, or H-I-D-A-H, -H, which isn't out yet now, but it will be soon, uh, which is on, on um, I think the subtitle is like Jewish counter-colonial thinking. Okay. Um, okay. So it's going to be a mostly intra-Jewish conversation or platform and whatnot. And a lot of my insights come also from having those conversations with them. Um, so, yeah, um, that's that's on Germany. <laughs> Um, yeah. The U.S. Is a, is a different response. It has to do with a lot of like what the Democrats think the Republicans want and don't want. And then the whole partisan shit in the U.S., which is has always been very toxic and I think has just been on steroids these days. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Speaking to about the U.S., um, mm -hmm. which is unfortunately, you know, mostly what I know. Mm -hmm. um, this particular, you know, since October, I have gotten the sense that being uncomfortable to, to use a tepid word um and 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 critical of israel and this and this whole thing is more acceptable than i ever remember it being yeah 
um, there's more, you know, debates about it. There's more mainstream media talking about it in very serious, specific death toll terms. And it's so clearly not enough. Um, yeah. So the sort of the moral, <laughs> the correct moral response is trailing far behind, but it's actually progressing, I guess. And I don't know if that's, you know, any consolation to anybody, but I, I, I would bet, uh, I, I feel very confident that there is a, there is a substantial shift there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, I had done, so a bit of a personal thing. I had done my master's about a decade ago now, almost on, um, the politics of language. So my, what I do is cultural studies for the most part. So just study things that are cultural. <laughs> it's very vague, but mostly media studies. And in that case, also like the politics of language. Uh, and my two languages I focus on were Hebrew and Yiddish. So I, I looked a lot at uh, Jewish political thought in the, of the 20th century. So I got into Zionism, anti-Zionism, all of that stuff, socialism, anarchism, all of that stuff. Um, and one of the kind of the interesting things is that one of my, towards the end of that thesis, I was looking at the case of the U.S. because at the time, this was 2016, there was a resurgence of, uh, you know, that was the Bernie moment and all of that stuff. There was a resurgence of a lot of um, Jewish Americans on the left, like this was when the Jewish Voice for Peace started becoming more and more mainstream, let's say, or at least more and more known, um, being openly uh, critical of uh, Zionism and the State of Israel or even like just opposing it entirely, like in the case of Jewish Voice for Peace, actually endorsing anti-Zionism as a, as a, as a movement. Mm -hmm. um, so my kind of the, the background, if you want, in that is I was looking at historically, what was it about the Yiddish language and the Hebrew language? Because in and of themselves, they're just languages, but how, how are they used? And the Yiddish one had this interesting history in Europe, the Bund and the, the, the Jewish anarchists, which were disproportionately uh, in the sense that you were overrepresented uh, among anarchists, if you were Jewish at the time, um, um, it was an interesting legacy to leave behind because Bernie, for example, at the time kind of made reference to it in one way or another. Like he said, he was a union kid growing up and his his parents were, you know, uh, labor, whatever. And th this, th this tradition actually comes from that. Um, so at the time in 2016, it was still mostly more or less taboo to talk about Israel in those terms. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of the beginning of that crack, I guess you could say, uh, that it was very significant that the only Jewish mainstream politician on the Democratic side did not go to that APAC conference, for example, when all of the non-Jewish ones were very happy to go. Mm -hmm. um, there was a very significant shift, in the, even, even, even only symbolically, if you want, but that, that was very important and very meaningful. Uh, that has just become more and more uh, the case since then. And I think the reason why this time around it's so uh, even more, um, well, let's say, easier to be highly critical of what the Israeli state is doing is the scale and is the, the how documented it is. That at the time, the, there's this term in Hebrew called Hasbara, uh, which is effectively it's propaganda. It, I think it means literally PR or whatever, or explaining. Um, and uh, the Israelis were pretty good at it for the most part. They, they've had this a kind of a, a used narrative that they would just recycle uh, whenever there was like a, a an uptick in violence, let's say in Israel-Palestine. Uh, they would say like, oh, the Palestinians are faking. They would use Pallywood, like Hollywood, but Palestinian. They would, you know, all of that stuff. There's a bunch of different things that they would kind of deploy, if you want, to paint everyone else who is not them, in this case, all of the Palestinians as, you know, homogeneous, monstrous, barbaric, all of that stuff. Um, now they, they kind of, they didn't have quite of a plan of how to do the Hasbara because their reaction to October 7th was clearly a one of vengeance. They wanted to, mm -hmm. they, they wanted to take revenge and they, they pretty much said so openly that, you know, um, that was the general, the day after the day off, I don't remember October 7th or 8th, um, saying something like, you know, we're going to cut off all of the food and all of the medicine, all of the world. And then he used the term like, these are not humans, these are human animals or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the language of dehumanization is not new in Israel. I, I, I covered the 2014 war on Gaza as well. And at the time you had the, I think, I think she was the Minister of Justice, Ayala Chaked or something, I forgot her name, um, describing like uh, snakes in, in Palestinian mother's wombs. They're like, you know, they're born toxic, they're born evil. Uh, and of course, the terms of vermin and, and, and pests and all of that stuff are 
pretty familiar language to anyone who has read anything on any genocide ever. Uh, whether it's Bosnia, whether it's Rwanda, the, the term vermin and pest comes to mind and all of that. Obviously, the Holocaust, the Nazi comparison of Jews to rats at the time and all of that stuff. It's it's not new, is what I'm saying. It's just, it's just, been, it's just being deployed in a, in a very specific way here. Um, so it's become more and more obvious that between the large-scale protests, all of the actions, which have been very inspiring and very good to see, and the fact that it's the most documented genocide, to use that framing, uh, in history, um, as of now, of course, um, is you know part of the fact that at the end of the day, the Israelis can say whatever they want, but you're seeing something with your own eyes, and they can even say, "Oh, it's all deep fake," but that's that's quite a lot of it, and you know there would be quite a lot to be done in terms of deep faking all of this if this was the case, um, and so people just at some point trust what they see with their own eyes and what they're hearing, what they're you know who they're talking to, and the stories coming out and all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that it's becoming easier and easier to be very critical of the state of Israel in the US, at the very least on the liberal slash left side of things. On the on the yeah. conservative side, and if anything, they've kind of doubled and tripled down on being just pro-Israel at all costs. Uh, because I think they are they genuinely admire the state of Israel. I think it's a good model for them. They want something that along those lines in America. There is also the paleo conservative I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. you can call it that contingent that has always been critical of Israel in a way that is vaguely suspicious, of course. Um, and I think that yes, Donald Trump absolutely. almost has one foot in each camp because he tends to be on that side, but he well, is obviously very pro-Israel in the usual American president sense. Um, so, yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's a bad mixture. I um I'd forgotten about Bernie Sanders, and I, I distinctly remember watching I believe a debate he did with Hillary, against Hillary Clinton, and noticing that he said the word Palestinians, and I noticed at the moment because I was like, wow, when has anybody ever mentioned them in a in this kind of context ever? So, you know, mm. that's the standards. Uh, that's the low standards, but that 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 was notable. Um, yeah. No. No. Absolutely. Uh, and also, like you can. You can use different criteria of like how many Palestinians are platformed on various, you know, mainstream media channels and whatnot. And this has changed significantly since I started paying attention to that specifically, like in okay. 2014, That's... a decade ago. Uh, it was, I, I can almost guarantee you that if you go back to the war in 2014, you may find like close to zero Palestinian on any of the mainstream platforms like CNN or what what have you. Um now it's it's pretty common to see them actually uh, more and more common more and more normal and to have like mainstream outlets from time magazine the new york times is notoriously the exception here due to their pretty horrific um editorial policies uh, this came out like yesterday i think or two days ago uh their their editorial line actually av- avoiding terms like refugee camp avoiding terms like ethnic cleansing like apartheid yes. um yeah. so in many ways they have made a decision of who to stand with here um, but, you know, even CNN, uh, just pretty mainstream in many ways, quote unquote, apolitical, or it never is entirely apolitical, um, platforms and publications uh, just talking to Palestinians. And if not that, just filming what's happening and having reports and going through the wire and stuff like that from Reuters or AFP or what have you. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, it's become more normalized if you want to understand this as a at the very least, oh, this is complicated. Like, oh, the other side, which in this case would be the Palestinians, because I think more, more, more Americans are used to hearing Israelis and about Israelis than to hear about Palestinians uh, on average in any case, course, especially yeah. white Americans. Yeah. Um, but it's become just at least more normal to say, oh, well, this is not okay. You know, there was the, the Christian Amanpo interview on Jon Stewart, like on The Daily Show just the other day. I, I saw a clip of it on social media. And at some point she, to her, I mean, I think people were kind of very harsh on her, but she didn't mean what the way it sounded, I think. But she said like we need uh, objective journalists. And she, what she was trying to say is that we, the journalists of the West, are not able to go into Gaza because the Israelis don't let us, which is true. Mm-hmm. Um, but she said it in a way that made it sound like there are no journalists in Gaza right now. And John Stewart responded like there are journalists, Palestinian journalists, and they are being killed by the Israelis. And even John Stewart, again, I remember 2014, 
uh, was more critical of Israel than others, um, let's say among among the democratic side of things, the democrat side of things, but even then wasn't entirely comfortable being like that clear and that straightforward about it, you know, that open about it, saying like actually Palestinian journalists are being killed. Just that, just those terms, which is the case, um, is already a shift, and because there's no there's no amount of propaganda you can kind of do to counteract that because. People who have reached that conclusion are not listening to you anymore. If you are the state of mm-hmm. Israel in this case, they have already concluded that you are doing this thing, which is in this case is is true. Do you have? Um, I'm just circling exactly back to it's it's an improvement and it's not enough. Do you have mm-hmm. any? What are your? Do you have any optimism about this? And do you like? What am I? What should? What sh- can any of us do? You know about? Yeah. Anything? So. I, I interviewed, um, well, it came out today, actually, um, Bill Fletcher Jr., an American, or African-American kind of elder activist um, of the, I guess, I guess I could describe him like the Angela Davis generation, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were talking about like the title of the episode is Taking Authoritarianism Seriously. And it's because I'm, I've been a bit troubled, <laughs> not a bit, really troubled mm-hmm. by the discourse I've seen, not about Biden, because he's a horrible person. <laughs> but about kind of the reverse of that kind of downplaying a bit what a Trump return would mean. Sure. Um, and uh, because it's easy to focus on what Biden is doing because what Biden is doing it. And it's, uh, I think, easy to forget what Trump did, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, everything he said about Israel, uh, doing the Abraham Accords without a single Palestinian in the room, all of that stuff. And what uh, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, is literally talking about like Gaza as a waterfront property today. <laughs> Um, I think if Trump comes back to power, uh, come November, well, January, whatever, uh, the Israelis will have so much more room to maneuver than what they even do now. And that's saying something because clearly they've gotten away with a lot of horrific shit. Uh, I think they would be kind of, uh, almost, uh, just encouraged by the Trump administration to go full ethnic cleansing and just get rid of every Palestinian in Gaza. And force them to Egypt or whatever, and basically force the Egyptian to open the border. Um, I really think this is what's going to happen if he wins, if he comes back. Uh, let alone everything that he would do to Americans uh, and to non-Americans in America and to refugees and to trans people and all of that stuff. Uh, and more importantly, because there is this bizarre thing among not just Americans, to be clear, but I mean we are talking about the U.S. here, um, of kind of seeing this as a as a almost like a like a sports you know it's just one side or the other and for me it's i i wouldn't say like oh you're voting for biden or for trump for me it's like who are you going to struggle against for the next four years and what are the specific conditions that that are going to be brought about by this person being elected and more importantly not, not just this person but the people around him and for me the people around trump scare me more than trump uh, yes, they are in many ways smarter <laughs> than he is and more cynical than he is. I'm thinking of the bandons mm-hmm. of the world and stuff like that. They know what they're doing and they they have a vision of things. They have a vision of what they want the U.S. to be and what they want the rest of the world to be. And of course, because it's the U.S., anything that happens there is going to affect all of us very, very deeply. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I've been very worried, to be honest, about the bit, the cavalier attitude that I've seen of like saying, oh, fuck him. You know, he's just genocide Joe and... If he if he wins, that means we're we're rewarding him. It's like I, I get that. I genuinely get that. And I hate that A, I'm not a huge fan of electoralism and I hate that it's it's only two options in the first place. Um but I think it's downplaying that it's this belief in uh, that's why I told Bill on the podcast, it's this belief that things can't get worse. Yeah. Um and I don't know where that comes from because historically that's never been the case. Things can always be literally every single time, if you think they cannot get worse, you are wrong. It can. They can. And that's that's my that's my worry right now. That's sort of where we're at. I'm hoping that like uh, the um, Republicans are so uh, chaotic that they just don't manage. But I could also just be optimistic here. Um, not because I like the Democrats, but among the Democrats, I see more room to maneuver. I see AOC and the people around her. I see uh, Rashida Tlaib, Rashida Tlaib, of course, and other pe- people around her who I think are more interesting, at least in more. There's more flexibility there, let's say. Um, they are more interested in trying to at least change things for the better, even though, again, the platform is not the one I would use. Um, 
than the other side, which I think is actually pretty gung ho about making things absolutely worse for as many people as possible <laughs> that are not like them. Yeah. Um, yes. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of where I stand on this. I think I, I gen, gen, generally agree with all of that. Um, and I'm not, you know, one to vote, especially for um, party A or B, but at the very least, I sure hope Joe Biden wins. And that's a horrible sentence to say. Um, yeah, that's the thing is like, I hope he wins and fuck that shit. <laughs> it's both at the same time. <laughs> it's, I mean, we already rewarded him. I, yeah. He was awful, you know, for 30 years, um, oh, yeah. to, mostly to Americans, but also, you know, voting for Iraq and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. he already got his reward <laughs> for being awful. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. <sighs> so, yeah, um, I just, it's a bit where I'm at in terms of just, I, I always worry that, that a lot of folks who I, I care about generally and who I completely understand, it's like it's a traumatic response in many ways. Um, don't think through what this could actually mean. Honestly, just, even for them, personally, what this kind of mean for them, because most of the people I'm talking to are like people of color, Arabs, Muslims, like Arab American, Muslim Americans, uh, who are so disgusted by him, understandably so, that they're like, well, fuck it, we know the other guy, he's a piece of shit, but we know him, and you know, bring it on and whatnot. I don't think you know what that means. I don't think you're actually, you're not thinking this through. And I hope by November they think it through if they are going to kind of vote or whatever. Or I don't know. Um, we'll see. I guess. <laughs> I genuinely, and I, again, I don't know enough about the whole world to generalize like this, but um, yeah, I feel like Americans have particularly short memories. Like my mm. friend was pointing out recently, people being like, "Oh, well, surely Trump won't be that bad," and it's like we already had him. Don't you remember? Yeah. And yeah, that has already like, happened. <laughs> <laughs> and he sounds he sounds worse in almost every way now, and he sounds genuinely much more unhinged. Which yes when yes. he's the guy who can unilaterally nuke stuff doesn't inspire confidence yeah. no matter how much yes, you dislike I institutional status quo yeah Ugh. i mentioned on the the episode with bill fletcher i mentioned there's this quote that i mean it's probably apocryphal as most quotes are <laughs> supposedly it's a quote from the soviet era of like mm -hmm. uh we thought it couldn't get worse we, we no we thought it we hit rock bottom and then we heard a knock from below <laughs> uh, and so it's kind of that and I don't want to be too grim about it but I think it's important to understand that things can get worse in order to prevent that from happening um, one thing that will happen when if Trump comes back is many more problems to deal with and people like us being kind of on the defensive many much more often let's say than we would under a it's just Biden 2.0 who, you know, he's old enough, it might be Kamala Harris anyway at some point, you know, whatever. Um, but there, there would be there would be less less and to emphasize. It's not that there won't there would be none of it. It's not that there would be nothing to struggle against. And you know, uh, comrades and trying to stop Cop City in Atlanta are clearly, you know, up clearly there's a lot to do, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Uh what what I'm trying to say is that with Trump, there would be so much fucking more stuff to do. And I don't think we can afford that. I, I just don't think we have the capacity or the resources to deal with something of that scale. Um, especially at a time when global warming is already what it is and this guy would just fucking put it on tuba mode. And I don't think we can afford this. I really don't think so. Uh, so for me, it's, it's less a matter. It's not a matter at all of like, do I like this person? And more like, is this person more likely to get Armageddon, and maybe if that's the case, maybe not. Like I, I, I don't want it. I'm, I'm not a fan. Um, so that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Um, yeah. Out of curiosity, I probably overstressed this question, but what are your thoughts on in? And this is probably too big as well. What are your thoughts on anarchist, um, radical, etc. involvement in electoral politics? You know. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so genuinely, uh, so I come from Lebanon, as I said, and I've only voted twice and only because I only could vote twice. Okay. Uh, both times I voted, let's say out of curiosity, because we've had the same warlords and oligarchs for 30 years and they are horrible and they've basically destroyed the entire place, uh, which is part one of the reasons I'm in exile. And you had a bunch of other folks who were like, 
I can only describe them as like technocrats or some, you know, middle class, nice people trying to do things in a nice whatever. And I'm not not my thing, but I was like, oh, you have this on one side and on the other side you have literal warlords. I was like, you know what, I will I will stick with that architect lady, you know, just like that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of my attitude towards voting. Uh, I see just, it's like five seconds of your day. And I see it as one tool, really. I n- understand the argument that it's part of a like legitimizing a process that we don't appreciate. But I think it's not the only time we do that. I think paying rent is one of it. I think is paying taxes is another, you know, so many ways we can argue that we're already kind of complicit in a system we're not happy with. Even just buying virtually anything today sure. um, is... I don't know if you've seen The Good Place, but there is a, a, a uh, ethical kind of quandary at some point. I won't spoil it for folks who haven't, but of like, it's so difficult to be good today because anything you do is like, in one way or another, maybe tied to a sweatshop somewhere or whatnot. And you don't want that, but at the same time, you don't know how to not do that. You know, whatever. And yes. um, sure. that's kind of how I see it. I see it as like, we have this one thing. Uh, it takes five seconds and it might... And might not, <laughs> but it might uh, make this difference in the sense of this other horrible, more horrible person not getting access to the nukes, or, yeah. you know, like that, to put it kind of bluntly. Um, and do I want Biden or do I want Trump access to the nukes? I, I want Biden. I That's it. You know, I just, the other guy is just way worse. It's that simple for me. I hate the first guy. I'm just more scared of the second guy. <laughs> That's the perfect uh, summary. There yeah. Right there. <laughs> Who do you want access to the nukes? Do, do you <laughs> want the nukes? No, I don't. I wish they would all be dismantled and they would disappear. It's just that that's not the options in front of me. That's not what I'm yeah. being asked. That's not the options, you know, that I'm being, in, in the, assuming I was American, which I'm not. But right? that, that wouldn't be what uh, I am asked to do in this situation. Um, that being said, I more than understand the desire and the need even to say fuck it all and i'm not gonna participate i disagree and all of that i i get that i just don't necessarily think electoralism is the the platform to uh express that disagreement i mean to i'm being a bit uh you know glib about it but um that that's kind of where i'm at just because the consequences are so beyond anything that is worth five seconds of your time yeah. Um, that's kind of where I'm at on that specifically. And I, I have come back and forth on this now. Like I can't even vote because there's no elections in Lebanon anyway. They've kind of hi- hijacked everything and, and whatnot. And I can tell you it's worse. And I, th- I think there's a reason in the context of the U S why the white supremacists want to disenfranchise African-American votes and, and Latinx votes and all of those other votes, because they are afraid of what that means. And for me, it's like, well, if the white supremacists are afraid of this, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of it. <laughs> I, I'm I'm happy with them being afraid of this, and I want them to mm-hmm. continue being afraid of this. Um, and that's kind of again where I'm at on this. Um, I wanted to ask you about something that's more optimistic, but I have to ask an obligatory, yeah, curious pure curiosity. Um, you're talking about nukes. You're talking about Palestine. What are your um, principles, I guess, on on violence or war? Um, Ooh, that's also like a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be in the neighborhood of pacifist, um, sure. but obviously you can talk yourself into some very ridiculous things if you go too far with that. Yeah, I mean, I, me too. You know, I'm even like I'm 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 borderline vegan most of the time because I just mm. don't like violence. <laughs> like I, I get it, and I'm I'm on that um, side of things, let's say. But what I would say is, uh, I can say this because I'm here in this situation, and I'm not in this other situation. So, if I was a person stuck in Barcelona during the siege of Barcelona and the civil war, uh, being a pacifist was probably kind of pointless. And if I were, if I was, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm going. You know, you know what I mean. Like if I was in Warsaw during the uprising, being a pacifist was probably completely meaningless, um, just because the alternative is the Nazis. You know, so at some point it's like I am a pacifist in the sense of my idealism, but and that's like a huge but. Uh, it really depends on the situation, and more importantly, or as importantly, um, violence as in like with a capital V for me is not something that is 
as interesting as trying to understand when, why does it happen when it happens. So like if you have um, a drone, to use a, a technology that's becoming cheaper and cheaper, being used by the Russians to bomb Kiev, uh, that's not the same thing for me as the Ukrainians using it to bomb a Russian tank. Sure. Like there's the same the same weapon, but the <coughs> sorry about that. It's the same weapon, but the um the the way it is being used is not the same. And in one case, it's defensive. And at the very least, this is where like I think international law has kind of got it right for all of its faults, and there were, there are many. Um, that the right to resist is actually enshrined in international law. What's not enshrined in international law is the uh, killing civilians. That's always illegal in every circumstances, period. Um, and hurting and torturing civilians, obviously, and all of that. Uh, but if you are uh, defending yourself and, and trying to stop an occupation or an apartheid system or a literal uh, genocide right now, I cannot conscious like, I cannot in good conscience say hey don't do that because I'm not there and I'm not going through that um and if you probably if you don't do that you are dead and that's it and your family's dead and everyone around you is dead and all of that stuff and for me it's just that's just not an actual choice that's not an option so for me that that's why like um you know or a less um sorry one sec <coughs> A less um, maybe dramatic example is looting. Um, I I Vicky Osterwald's book on looting is fascinating, um, and because the argument which I I kind of knew I had this hunch about looting at the time, that because but the studies that that, that she cites, um, I think she goes by she if I'm mistaken, that she cites um, are kind of confirmed that if you want, that uh, most of the looting happens in specific circumstances. And there are, there's almost like an ethics of looting as well. Like you have a lot of looters who, who or would be looters. You're not like this, not your job, but uh, who uh, would just go towards like the corporate chains and the banks and whatnot, but wouldn't touch like the little, the little deli, you know, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because it's like they know that like the person who's in the little deli is probably just as miserable as they are. And there's the sense of like, I'm going to take something because I need to or because I want to. Uh, and I'm going to do so from a, a place where that's very expensive and very rich because they probably have insurance anyway. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's an example of like, do I like it? I mean, I guess not, but do I, do I judge the people who do it because they, they think they're in, they, they are in a situation that they feel like they need to, I, I, I can't, I don't, I can't in good conscience judge them for that. Um, so that's, that's kind of the principle, if you want, of it all, uh, again, extremely circumstantial and situational and depends where and how, and all of that. But, um, you know, I, if you, if I think anyone who watches like Inglorious Bastards and sees a bunch of Jews trying to kill Nazis, uh, I, I get it. <laughs> so like, I'm, I'm not going to just say, no, don't do that because <laughs> the Holocaust. So, you know, I can't. I can't be in a situation where I'm going to judge you for that. You know, I'm, I'm going to be like, oh, I hope we can still work towards a world that this is not needed. But in order to get there, you need to think about capitalism and patriarchy and the nation state and so many other things. But if in the moment it's like you or the Nazi, uh, well, do you do you? That's, you know, that's where I'm at on that. Yeah, my um, example to I kind of agree with all of that. Mm. Um an example that I gave to myself about the limits of pacifism, besides, you know, a guy breaks into your house and attacks you. I think most, sure. almost everybody on earth says you can do something about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if I really wanted to talk myself out of supporting, you know, the Warsaw ghetto uprising, because maybe like Wehrmacht divisions of people who were drafted are there and like um, they didn't, you know, choose. I mean, then it would get ridiculous, as, as you say, it gets. But um at the same time, all of the stuff you just said, which is correct and good, I feel like is also warped, um, not even consciously we, for all people, you know, when you're talking about, say, it, Israel wants to get rid of Hamas and mm-hmm. therefore they are defending themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously you need, you know, proportionality as a principle or the basic idea that what if you're not allowed to bomb urban areas ever? <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I agree with you, but even those, even that can be warped into something very, very bad, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, 
you can have a lot of good principles. Um, it's important to know where where they meet meet their limits. And by limits, I don't mean that they are irrelevant and that you shouldn't have them. But for example, they, so when I talk about like solar punk or anarchism or feminism or whatnot, I'm all of these things. At the same time, I don't think that feminism has the answer to everything in the world. Or sure. anarchism has the answer to everything in the world or solar punk for that matter. I think that they have the answer to a lot of things or they allow to understand things in a more logical way and more meaningful way, I think, anyway, that than these other isms or whatever. Um, but, you know, uh, I don't know. Global warming probably needs so many more th- isms and other things to do to tackle it, you know, than just this or that. So I'm not saying it's unimportant to have principles because I think you kind of end up becoming too cynical if you do so. Um, but just understand that there are often circumstances that are beyond your control, beyond the control of people who are oppressed, more importantly, and that if they if they engage in means that are bad, you don't like to have those, you don't have to like those means. You don't have to like Algerians bombing a cafe at the time of the Algerian independence, the war of independence. You don't have to like the IRA bombing some random English cities or the tube or whatever it might be in London. You don't have to like those, but I think you did. You do need to understand where does this come from? Um, what is it about the Irish that makes them so angry at the time about the British <laughs> government mm-hmm. uh, or the Algerians about the French government? Why? Like Then try and understand that. And then understanding does not mean justifying. I don't know why this is so so complicated for many people, to be honest. You for need to Americans. understand something. <laughs> you need to understand something. It's like, you know, after 9-11, it was so taboo to try and understand why did Al-Qaeda do what it did? Because if you understand it, therefore you like it? Is that I didn't know. I never knew this was the only other options. You can understand it because you want to, you read what they say and whatnot, and you can still conclude, well, okay, I, I guess, yes, it's bad for the Americans to have done this in the 80s and 90s, but, you know, maybe don't bomb people anyway. You know, you can you can have those two thoughts. It's, it's actually very possible. Um and I, I mentioned Bin Laden because recently there was a trend on TikTok of uh, people sharing his uh, infamous letter mm-hmm. to America. Um, and I generally think people haven't read the actual letter because he's ex- he was always unhinged. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he compared the bombing of Afghanistan to just gay people, and that's that was his. Those are the, for him was like just moral equivalencies of the same at the same level. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> just to say that. Uh, I, I don't know why it's difficult to understand that understanding does not mean liking something. You need to understand how you need to understand the things you don't like. Uh, I think that's actually an important lesson uh, that I've learned a bit the hard way. Um, I, that's why I did my master's on, on Hebrew and Yiddish. Uh, and that's why I think my knowledge of Zionism is actually pretty good. I've read Zionist texts and I've engaged with it. Uh, and that's why like, I, I think now I can even understand the nuances between a type of anti-Zionism that is actually anti-Semitic and a type of anti-Zionism, which is the one I, I use, which is, of course, not and, and very much against anti-Semitism and just pro-liberation. Um, if you don't know that, if you don't know that this could be a thing because the Israelis are saying all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, that's wrong. But it doesn't mean that no anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. Uh, there are types of anti-Zionism that are anti-Semitic, and you need to know this because it's bad to be anti-Semitic. Um, and if you don't do, if you don't know this, you're more likely to uh, maybe share someone who is actually an anti-Semitic asshole uh, because they said care. something you like on Palestine. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you need to know these things. <laughs> on the other hand, there um, is a, there was at least one um, leader of the survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising who became. Uh, really intense anti-Zionist. So, oh yeah, as there's, much there's a few as much as <laughs> there are um, plenty of people that you don't want on the you know the side of anti-Zionism because they're awful. Um, we may be thinking of the same person. Of, maybe, yeah, I don't remember. She, um, <laughs> she's in her nineties now, and she was supposed to come on Hida that podcast I mentioned, but I think there was some scheduling issue. Um, I hope it happens. So it should be an interesting conversation. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, but you know, Jonathan Glazer did that uh, movie, uh, The Zone of Interest, on the people who are living next to a concentration camp. 
and he won the Oscars for it. And then, and he's Jewish. And when he came on mm-hmm. stage, he said that he, they, he, refu- we are men who refute their Jewishness being used uh, by an occupation that has caused so much suffering, something along those lines. And of course, people who wanted to hear what they heard, uh, what they wanted to hear, uh, misinterpreted his words or just purposefully ignored what he actually said. But I think that's that's the position I'm at. I'm someone who is. I can I can generally say, and I'm not even kidding. I think maybe it's an autism thing. I don't know, but I'm generally still angry about the Holocaust. <laughs> I'm still yeah, angry it happened. <laughs> I'm still really angry it happened. It could have easily not happened if you look at the the way it was building up. The warnings were there as clear as day. Um, And many people were saying, hey, this is what's going to happen. And then while it was happening, many people were saying, hey, this is happening. Uh, And they were just ignored. The world shrugged. Yeah, the world shrugged. So... I, I, that's my lesson of that. You know, the whole never again is I take it very literally and I take it very seriously. And many Jews, thankfully, do as well. Um, hence the If Not Now uh, collective and Jewish Voice for Peace, of course, and Jewish Currents, as I mentioned, a bunch of other places that are pretty cool. So, anyway, those that's. Those people are the best. I love those people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, oh, I always want to take people down historical tangents, but we don't have time, darn it. Um, <laughs> This is not a good segue, but you did mention solar punk, and I wanted to ask mm. you a little bit about it because I actually learned about solar solar punk from an interview last year or when it, earlier in the my this podcast for me. So, um, and solar punk is a very intriguing idea. Um, mm. And what attracted you to it? Um, so I was always, well, I mean, for some time kind of into futurisms that are more optimistic than others. So, you know, there's Afrofuturism and you have Afro nihilism and both are pessimism, sorry, Afro pessimism. And both are super interesting. But I think, and I think Afro pessimism is different than pessimism. It has a very specific um, focus, let's say, um, that have to do with like the black condition in the world today. Uh, and historically, at least the past, like let's say f- four centuries, give or take. Um, Afro uh, futurism is fascinating to me because many of these stories, at least the one that I, I enjoyed reading the, the most, were just picturing situations where being black was just just that. You're just someone who happens to be black. In order for that to be possible in a context like the U.S., where, of course, 400 years of slavery and then Jim Crow and racialization and mass incarceration, all of that stuff, um, in order for that to be impossible to just be a black person, especially a black man in, um, or a trans woman or whatnot in, in like public or surrounded by cops or in situations of danger and not be in, in at risk of your life literally being, uh, taken away and, or whatever, or at least being incarcerated or what have you. So much has to change for that to even be possible. Mm-hmm. It has to do with the police system, with car- carcerality. It has to do with with capitalism, with patriarchy, with the nation state, how it's formed, especially in the U.S. context, and so on and so forth, that in order to even get there, there's, the, there's this amazing Baldwin. I, I cite him a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. obsessed with him. <laughs> um, there's this, um, it, it's in that documentary, I'm Not Unique, or by Raoul Peck that came out like some years ago, about a decade ago now, mm-hmm. I think, more or less. Um, that is like, you know, he was, asked, he was asked by this interviewer, who's clearly white, a white man, uh, saying like, you know, aren't you happy or grateful, I don't know what it was, that, you know, there's been so much progress uh, for the rights of African-Americans, or at the time they would say the rights of Negroes or whatever. And he, like, Baldwin was like, um, uh, this has taken the life of my grandfather, it's taken the life of my father, it's taken the life of my sister, it's taken the life of my nephew, it's taken the life of my life, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then he ends up saying, like, how much time do you want for your progress? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where it's at. If you are the interviewer and you're asking that question, um, as also Baldwin uh, reflected when he was asked that specific question, is that asking this question in and of itself reveals so much because the assumption that you're making is that you are already on the side of good and you are already kind of neutral, if anything. Like As long as you don't do anything, you can't be bad. But the problem is that you are already part of a system that has actually made sure that other people, in this case, black people, don't have it good. <laughs> mm-hmm. They cannot just be. And so that's why I, 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 
I came to uh, I that's how I came to Afrofuturism and solar punk is sort of the added layer sometimes they're in conversation sometimes they're not and uh, I did this interview about a year ago called towards Afro solar punk because there's a conversation to be had in those two spaces and solar punk is just a movement that can be uh it can just die out in a few years it can become just like irrelevant I don't know like I'm not like saying you know something is uh, it's not like a golden silver bullet or whatever um but it has this interesting framework which is like imagine it's the year 2050 and we are in Jerusalem and Jerusalem is at peace and uh it's sustainable uh we have green energy all around that is not mined under slavery conditions and shit like that uh and people are genuinely happy and there's a high standard of living and it's there's you know people from different backgrounds and faiths and whatnot are coexisting jews muslim christians whatever and atheists and so on um what does that look like let's picture it and we can put it in a scenario we can give it a plot uh, there could be, you know, a hero here and there if you want to. Solar Punk actually doesn't have too many individual arcs and heroes. The heroes arc is something that they avoid, which actually I find interesting, uh, because it's all about community. So it's like, what what is the community in that? You know, can you imagine like Jerusalem in 2050, and it's like a communal garden, and the communal garden for even that for that to even exist, uh, you know, today it can't, it legally cannot. Because you will have to regulate if you're in the western side of Jerusalem or the, the eastern side, what are the, your residency status of all of the people who would like, in theory, to attend that communal gardening and all of that stuff. So just by imagining something very simple that is patently good, like a communal garden, in a situation that right now is very difficult to imagine, you know, it's kind of a bit like Star Trek key. It's a Trekkie thing of like, oh, it's 300 years into the future. So you don't have to deal with the complicated questions of today because, well, we we solved it. We solved it. 100 years from now, it's solved. That's it. We're good. And so what happens like 100 years after that? <laughs> and that's for me allows allows a bit of a flexibility in the imagination of things, you know, and that's that's why I like, I like Solar Punk to hopefully grow into more and more. And my hope is that I'm able to do more on that for now. I've just mostly been someone who's been writing about it from time to time and talking about it a lot, but I haven't actually written any solar punk stories, but I, I would love to. So it's just one of those things. I um, found it immediately intriguing because, um, cause it's not primitivism for one thing, no, which, <laughs> which unfortunately in some ways is, you know, to me is the most ableist ideology. Yes. Short of fascism, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, to be dramatic um and the idea that humans could actually figure out how to like that's what we should do realistically to me yeah <laughs> which is very easy to say but you know humans live in cities they change the environment we just aren't doing that in a way that's responsible <laughs> we've always changed the environment and indigenous folks of what is now called americas have, have were also changing the environment the amazon rainforest mm -hmm. exists because partly at the very least because humans changed it in a certain way they just changed it in an amazing way, and that's mm -hmm. good. And we can. That's the point. Is there is a, a I did my my bachelor degree was in environmental health, and there was the a conservation biology course, and the kind of the mainstream ideology when it comes to conser conservationism, and and just like what to do to preserve this or that, is well let's let's cordon it off and make sure people don't go there, because <laughs> people are bad, and that's that. <laughs> And the Maasai mm -hmm. in Kenya, for example, were uh, exiled from a, lo a lot of their lands because a bunch of Kenyan conservationists and American and British conservationists decided this land needs to be protected for this or that species. Oops. And <laughs> the Maasai were like, well, we're not the ones threatening that species, but it didn't matter because that's the framework that they operate under, the, the folks who mm -hmm. doing, are doing that. So I think it's a very cynical, very Western in many ways and by Western, I don't just mean off the West. I think historically, it's a Western thing that has since become more hegemonic around the world. Um, a very cynical view of the human being. One that is very uh, individualistic, very selfish. One which doesn't view humans as actually part of a community. One which ironically confirms or at least um, uh, recycles, uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher's infamous, there is no such thing as a society. 
uh, I think that's wrong. And I think if that's the framework you operate under, of course, you're going to think that humans are just there and bad for everything and like going to destroy everything and everything's going to turn out like the, the planet in Wally or whatever. Of course, you believe that if that's the case. But I, what I'm saying is that not everyone does and not everyone has actually acted that way. And we have the fucking proof and we have data and the UN itself has recognized that indigenous territory, uh, uh, territory that is stewarded by indigenous folks is more likely to do well than territory that is stewarded by everyone else. And that's interesting. <laughs> there's, there's something to that that we can study maybe. But yeah. That is interesting. Um, um... What about degrowth and like what does that um, mean to you? Because to me, that makes me slightly nervous as a word. Oh, that. sure. And, yeah, and I get it. <laughs> That's why I kind of I prefer using post growth. Um, okay. uh, the reason for that is so we know that we have a problem, which mm-hmm. is that we have economic growth on a finite planet. Mm-hmm. So we know that as a matter of fact, just like scientifically, we need to have less of the thing that is uh, consuming the planet. Now, there are two ways of doing that. One is extremely dark. And one is the Thanos version of the Avengers, basically. Sure. Just kill everyone or kill the poor people or do this or that, which honestly, many billionaires want that. And they, P- Peter Thiel is pretty obvious, pretty open about it. Even Musk is more, more and more open about it. That's why they're, they're so obsessed with overpopulation as long as it's quote-unquote overpopulation, uh, as long as they're not talking about white babies. Uh, because mm-hmm. Elon Musk has a lot of those. Um, an army of babies now. Yeah. yeah. And so as this is something like Monbiot, uh, George Monbiot, the, the environmentalist, the British one, uh, mentioned, right, right, has written a few times, which is that it's not so much about just population, numbers of people, but how resources are consumed. And we know for a fact that if you're a billionaire or a millionaire or whatnot, you're much more likely to consume so much more mm-hmm. than like a billion people underneath you, more or less. And so uh, population or so-called overpopulation is actually a capitalism problem. It's not a people problem. People are not the problem here. You having one kid or five kids is not the problem. It's whether the fact that you having uh, one kid means that you get to feed that kid better than you having five kids. Because that's a problem. That's a problem of society if you having a second kid means that the first kid has to suffer. That's a that's a problem of scarcity. That's a scarcity. That's a politics of scarcity. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's in more more often than not, it's artificial scarcity, uh, one that, uh, as we know from example of famines around the world, the vast majority of the time, it's not because there was no food, it's because food became unaffordable, and most people actually don't like to loot, <laughs> and unfortunately, and whatnot. And so, I know from Lebanon, I come from a, a background where there was a famine about a century ago in 1915, the famine of Mount Lebanon. People can look it up the Great Famine, I think it's called at the time, where like a, a something a third of the population died or, or went into exile or something like that. But not because there was no food. There was a blight, a pest of like uh, crick- crickets, I don't remember, one of them, uh, killed a bunch of the crops, but there was still food. It just was, it was being hoarded. And the price of wheat was being artificially inflated by this billionaire, well, today's equivalent of a billionaire, and so on. And so that's what led to the famine. And so... A post-growth for me is just a, a rational way, when done well, of trying to understand the limits of planet Earth and trying to live well within those means. There, is a, there was a project that I think now it's finished, but it was, it's called the Lilly Project, L-I-L-I, in, in the UK. I don't remember which university. By Julia Steinberger, who's a friend of mine and lives here in Switzerland as well. And she's been on the podcast a few times. She's one of the IPCC authors. Um she uh living it's a uh, living well within limits i believe is what lily stands for and it's those two it's living well within limits right now we're being given the option of either you live well or you live within the limits and mm-hmm. i guess the argument of post growth is that that's a wrong that's a false binary and it's a binary that by definition most people will never have access to because if, if living well means that you have to ignore the limits, that means someone else would be forced to be within those limits. And someone else, and usually the, usually the world's poorer, as we know, poorest, and mostly in the global south, but not just, will have to do without that fancy fridge or whatnot, because we live in a world where if you have it, they don't get to have it. And there are, there's all of these ethical considerations to be done, to be quite like, the, uh, Julia is very good at this. Uh, you know, if you have like, I don't know, you think of a building that has a hundred people in it living, let's say, 
if they have 10 communal washing machines and everyone has access to them because there's a, and then you have people who are very geeky about it and trying to think of like a logical system of uh, how to, um, um, how to, how do you say this? How to allocate resources in a rational way and still making it flexible and whatnot. But not you're not just less likely to to spend. You just you know you you will spend less energy overall individually and also per building. You're also more likely to uh, use it more in the sense of like you will actually wash more clothes, um, and you know and it's cheaper for you of course because you're dividing the cost of electricity. Let's say whatever all of these things rather than having one building that has a hundred different washing machines. And the public transportation argument is the best one. We know this from Musk. Like, you know, just build another lane or whatever. And of course, at some point, you can only build so many lanes because a single train can uh, accommodate like 10,000 cars or something ridiculous like that. And so that's what post-growth is in essence. It's trying to look at the problem of overconsumption and of resource extraction on a finite planet and trying to see how what what should we be doing right now to have, uh, uh, contrary to probably a, a popular mis- uh, uh, misconception, it's not that there will be no growth. It's about what kind of growth and where. So mm-hmm. growth in hospitals, yes. Growth in maybe, I don't know, schools, sure. You know, <coughs> sorry. Um, growth in schools, sure. Growth in, I don't know, um, access to food, cool, amazing. But growth in uh, planes, probably not. You know, stuff like that. Like, what, where are the limits and how do we think about them? That's where I think post growth kind of thinking is can be very, very useful on that. Um, I guess I, I have now two, based on that, I have two questions, which yeah. are, again, more vast. I'm curious about your thoughts on nuclear power. Mm. And I'm curious if you have in your mind, if there's a role for... Um, anti-capitalist markets, exchanges, mutualism, anything along those lines in, in your vision of the um, world? So um, I think it's important to differentiate between capitalism and market. Mm-hmm. Uh, market is just, it's it kind of a, it's almost a term of like inaction rather than, than a thing that's just there. It's like something that people do with one another. A thing they mm-hmm. exchange, not just bartering, but even if they exchange it for money, um, it doesn't have to be under a capitalist condition. Capitalism is more like what do you do with that profit and who controls the means of production, et cetera, et cetera. That's where it gets capitalism. <laughs> um, making money out of money and making money out of land and out of rent and all of that stuff. That's where the capitalist consideration, uh, the capitalist question comes in. Um, I'm very interested in those questions of like, oh, can we have a market-based anti-capitalist society? Um, mm-hmm. Not even saying it's necessarily the most ideal or the best, but I'm curious about that tension there mm-hmm. i'm um less interested in sort of the ancap side of things uh, yeah. the anarcho capitalist side of things because i don't i just don't even take them seriously um because they it's a misunderstanding probably i mean in the best of terms if i want to be generous a misunderstanding <laughs> of the term uh market <laughs> uh probably yeah. think maybe that's what they're thinking if they're being nice about it i don't know but if it's just <laughs> about like being libertarian in the american sense of things not in the original sense of the term libertarian um, uh, which is, you know, people don't, maybe in America don't know this, but in virtually everywhere, everywhere else, libertarianism is a left-wing thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in America, it's a right-wing thing. In France, the word libertaire literally means anarchist, basically, uh, in the left-wing sa- sense of anarchist. Um, so anyway, all of this to say that... Um... <sighs> Sorry, I lost slightly my train of thought. But... Um... It's interesting to to explore. I was really into like, um, yeah, mutualism, um, kind of like even co-ops in a more radical sense of the term. At some point, you kind of hit the question of scale. And that's mm-hmm. that's a complicated one, which I'm not necessarily the most uh, equipped to do. Uh, but it is one that many smarter people are trying to think about. And I think that it can be actually resolved on a, on a communal level as well. And... Um, it probably looks differently in different places. As for the question of nuclear power, that <laughs> honestly, I'm so torn on this to mm-hmm. this day. Uh, I just am. I don't like it. At the same time, the alternatives are so worse yeah. um, that sometimes I do find myself saying, I guess, okay, for now, I suppose. We still need to deal with the waste, though. <laughs> you know, like, stuff mm-hmm. like that. So 
I don't know. Uh, oil is infinitely worse than nuclear power. Um, so much worse on uh, virtually every single criteria used. It's so much worse. Uh, and if there was like a magic wand and you ask me, hey, let's turn all of the oil rigs today into nuclear power plants, I'll tell you, fuck it, go for it. Yeah. Um, would there be consequences? Sure. <laughs> and uh, what to do with the waste, of course, is the big one um, and other associated issues. So I don't know. Uh, of course, the, it's a nuclear power plant, so it can also be vulnerable to attacks, as mm -hmm. we, we saw in Ukraine a number of times. Uh, although my understanding from people who are um, in favor of nuclear power is that there are so many more things you can do to damage an oil rig than there are things you can do to damage a nuclear power plant. Um, and the consequences in terms of uh, oil leaks and, and uh, you know all of that stuff, stuff is obviously clear, much worse. So let's say on the fence... <laughs> um not not uh ideologically against it um i think a lot of the anti-nuclear campaigning in places like germany probably had unintended consequences that they did not calculate for mm -hmm. um i don't blame them i think that's just what happened uh, and the, the because the end result was that the germans were more de uh, dependent on fossil fuel which was largely Russian, and so they were. They have been effectively partly funding the the war on Ukraine, uh, and then when they wanted to get less of the Russian one, they bought the Azerbaijani one and the Qatari one and the Venezuelan one and whatnot, which is still oil. So you know, still bad. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I don't know. That's why for me, that's like, fair. yeah, <laughs> for me, like, I'm like, it's not that. Do I hate this thing? Uh, sure, but. Is the other thing that is very likely to take over if this thing isn't adopted worse, uh, then I guess we can start with this thing, which is slightly less bad. I was curious because um, the Solarpunk magazine lady that I learned about Solarpunk from was against nuclear power. So now mm. I'm curious to make see if I become a true Solarpunk, whether we can work with that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's disagreements on that. Uh, and there's a lot of... <laughs> Nuclear is interesting because of course there's a lot of emotional resonance with you know if you're Japanese and you experience Fukushima yeah. or you know whatever. Yeah. Um, so I I get it I get the hesitation mm -hmm. I'm not saying it comes from nowhere, uh, but I do think we need to think of the um, consequences of this other big problem even even green energy uh in i'm gonna in have an episode soon i, I call against against green colonialism because a lot of the mining happening for the lithium and whatever is happening in a context that is extremely neo-colonial and horrible and sure. ex ex extractivist and exploitative and all of that stuff uh yeah. and so maybe you know me here in <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> maybe me here in switzerland i can have a nice uh electric car or whatever but the, who paid for it you know mm -hmm. um so there are consequences and calculations for all of these things it's not just about the output it's not just about what does it look like when it's finished mm -hmm. uh it's okay. actually most of the time wh what do we need to do to actually build it mm -hmm. um and for me it's more complicated than just being against something or for something that's a good answer um <laughs> i'll let you go soon i, I <laughs> we like to ask at um at non Serbian because we like you know our anti capitalist markets and thinking about that. Yeah. Um, how would I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Because um, I really want one. Um, I mean, I guess if I if so, it's we're talking about a utopia, so I can be imaginative here. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would imagine that I'm already from a place because our two. It depends where, right? If you are in a place where um, coffee is already in abundance and it can be grown, then it's a matter of like, oh, well, if it's harvested in a communal way and sustainable and the people who are growing the crop and whatnot are happy with their lives and all of that stuff, well, then you get the product that comes out of that. And uh, maybe it can even be cooler instead of in a fucking starbucks or whatever you have it uh, around the table uh, very close to the fields maybe and that's even lovelier because you know where it comes from um so that's like if it's next to you if it's not next to you if you don't live there i mean uh, in the areas where they grow coffee then it's like okay we know where it comes from ideally uh we know how it's been transported also ideally 
and we know the conditions throughout that chain of command chain of production sorry um that is not has not been one of exploitation uh i don't i generally don't think it's uh a necessity to have exploitation in a um production in a supply chain i think that's Absolutely. actually the 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 consequences of capitalism and it has actually rendered things much more inefficient in many many ways because the priorities has not been how do we make sure that everyone can get access to coffee the priorities has been how do we make sure that we can profit off of the coffee that's right. those are two different calculations two different questions to answer um so and i think if we spend the same amount of energy answering the first one we would happily just have those uh you know resolved already from by now so if you uh, so the, uh, the to answer the second one it's like if you're not there you would know where it comes from and how it's been produced and whatnot and you would genuinely know not just you have the photo of a random peasant on the on the you know <laughs> he's smiling for some reason or whatever and then you feel good about yourself uh, yes. Because I feel everyone, I think everyone at this point knows like this is not, <laughs> this is kind of bullshit. Um, I hope. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's that's how I would do it. And more importantly, I would hope that you would get your cappuccino in a kind of a communal way, by which I mean, <laughs> not that everyone is doing something at the same time, uh, mm-hmm. but that, you know, you, if you're using oat milk, you know where the oat is coming from. Maybe you know the person who has uh, grown it, uh, you know, maybe it's all of that. And there's something very, uh, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, of course, but there's a reason it is a cliche that if you know where it comes from and you, you even know the people by name, um, like, as I said, I'm borderline vegetarian, but in Lebanon, uh, my neighbor has chickens um, and they just live on the land. She doesn't even kill them or anything, which I find amazing. Uh, and they just produce eggs anyway. And so she gives us some of the eggs. I was like, oh, cool. I know where they come from. I'm going to enjoy yeah. this omelet now. Uh, and it's that simple, <laughs> you know, in my head, it's sometimes things don't have to be more complicated than, than they, they need be. Um, of course, again, this is like on a one-to-one level at the question, at the question of scale, something else mm-hmm. happens and that's why it gets complicated, but complicated does not mean, um, impossible and it doesn't mean it cannot be resolved. It just means that you'll probably have to take other things into consideration, uh, in terms of supply chain, in terms of, uh, uh, am I going to wait five weeks for my cappuccino? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> Those are things that will have to be taken into account as well. All right. Fair enough. Um, and I guess going back to you to, to to try to wrap up, even though this is all very good and interesting, I like it. Um, with the fire these times um, and some of your other projects, sort of how, like, what are your goals? Like, what do you kind of hope to do and expect to do? with with what you do yeah uh we are expanding now uh as much as we can so now we have actually four podcasts under the same umbrella or from the periphery uh the kind of the initial one is the fire these times uh which is the one i founded in 2020 um and what i would like for it i'll speak for the fire this time before speaking about uh from the periphery uh i want the fire these times to be uh regular I want it to be a source of income as well. I mm-hmm. like it just on a personal level because I've been doing this for four years now. Um, I wanted to uh, platform fascinating people who uh, most of the time don't get to be platformed. And I want them to, I want to put them in touch with other people who are more so platforming. Uh, and some, that's something that's very enjoyable to do on a podcast, which is like, you know, you've sure, had this yeah. guest on and then this other guest on and then this other guest on and then you're like, Oh hey, you guys should probably talk to one another. <laughs> so you have the three of them on, uh, and that that's I enjoy doing that from time to time. One of the I think the most enjoyable ones have been like I put two Ukrainians and uh, and two Taiwanese next to one another. And I was like, let's see what happens. <laughs> sure, and, yeah. And it's almost always. I mean, always as of now, something happens, uh, and that's what's mm-hmm. interesting. Um, so I want to explore more and more these permutations, if you want, like. What, what does someone who is uh, a, a survivor of the genocide in Tigray uh, by the Ethiopian state, uh, do they have, do they see what's happening in Gaza from a specific lens than uh, someone who doesn't have that experience, let's say? Probably yes, but how and, and what? And more importantly, I want them to vocalize it. I want them to actually say that out loud because there's something that happens when they say so out loud. In some cases, it's even cathartic for them, of course, if they want to. Um, and it's very m- meaningful for, let's say, the Palestinian in this example to hear it as well. Um, 
so that's like on the far this time side i want to explore more and more the permutations of like from solar punk to feminism from anarchism to international law to whatever different um topics that are complicated but not impossible to understand and trying to make them more and more accessible by first making it accessible to myself like me trying to understand it first and then trying to make other folks like help other folks understand it so from the periphery is the broader umbrella term uh that includes the fire these times uh, mm-hmm. Politically Depressed, uh, which is a podcast, Obscuristan, which is a podcast, uh, and Chida, which is a Jewish one I mentioned, which is not out yet. Um, there's going to be a mini-series that are under one or two of those umbrella terms as well. Like one that's going to be on Syria called The Impossible Revolution that's going to come out in probably at the end of the year, if we're lucky, uh, that we're slowly preparing. There's going to be a bunch of different ones where we like we do a deep dive on a specific topic. A specific country, a specific place, sometimes a featuring interviews, sometimes not, uh, depending on the budget that we find, all of that stuff. And um, uh, yeah, eventually zines as well. We, we're already collaborating with the Antidote zine um, that does the transcriptions on our website uh, of the fight of the Friday Times episodes. I mean, on the on the FridaySimes.com, they can they can be found. Um, and uh, hoping to do like actual zines as well under those terms. Hoping to be able to pay authors to write interesting pieces. And, you know, all of that stuff, because uh, it's fun. And by fun, I mean, <laughs> it's in genuinely enjoyable and, and meaningful to do something like that and to channel the that energy that would otherwise be like despair and, and hopelessness, which I've, I've had my fair share of over the years, um, to channel it into something that feels meaningful. You know, really that simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, folks can uh, support by just checking it out, checking the podcasts out, uh, subscribing, that sort of thing, reviews, blah, blah, blah. And there's the Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Friday Slimes as usual uh, for folks who want to do that. If you, I mean, you don't have to, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but if you want, if you can. Um, yeah, that's uh, what we're hoping to do. Uh, and we are, we're growing. I mean, we were just me <laughs> and now we're 10. Um, mm-hmm. And we're doing our own thing at different paces and some of us are more productive than others for now and all of that, but it's it's going in a, a very interesting direction and I'm, I'm excited for what's coming. Yeah, it sounds like non-Serbium should uh, take some tips from you all a little bit. Oh, happy uh, to chat. I, lo- I, love, I yeah. love to spread the seeds. <laughs> <laughs> that's all very... Um... It's 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 inspiring to hear that. I oh, like good. I like to hear that. Um, well, I guess briefly I'll say that as usual, people can follow non Serbium all over the internet on Twitter and Mastodon and Blue Sky, and they can follow me personally if they want to. Um, and you, who have been a fabulous guest, <laughs> I thank you. Um, where uh, personally, if you want to tout any of your other stuff on the internet, where can the people find you? Even though. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I archive my stuff and I sometimes blog at uh, I write stuff dot blog. Uh, mm-hmm. Between us, I was amazed that that your URL was available, <laughs> <laughs> but it was. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I, I mostly archive things like if I've published an article or an essay somewhere, I, I would put it there. I haven't yet archived the podcast related stuff because there's a lot of it, but eventually I will. Uh, and I publish like just blog posts, like reflections on certain things, kind of like a newsletter, I suppose. Uh, mm-hmm. People can just subscribe to it. It's free. It will always be free. Um, and at some point, I think I'm going to add like a tip jar or whatnot, but it's going to it's gonna remain free. Um, and I am on um, Instagram and, and Mastodon and Blue Sky under that, that name, Elia Ayub. Um, it should be easy enough to find. Otherwise, just go on, probably just go on iWriteStuff.blog and there's probably an icon somewhere at the top uh, that if folks want to check my stuff out there i mean it's, i'm not super active to be honest but I, I i try to be from time to time uh otherwise yeah most of what i do in terms of public output is on the fire these times really i think uh so people can check that out if they want and they should thank you all right i'm gonna end this thing but thank you again for coming on today it's been really good thank you thank you very much Serbian podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. 
can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much. Thank you.